Hopefully, most of us had a reasonable night's sleep. I know it's always a challenge, isn't it? Sort of sleeping in a different location to usual. For anyone who wasn't with us last night, we are this weekend in the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. It's a slightly, I guess, different place to spend time on a church camp. But I'm, I'm hoping what you'll find over this weekend is that this is a text that has a lot to say to our contemporary situation. If you have not yet turned to Habakkuk in your Bible, uh, or if you're, you need to get that open on your phone or other device, now would be a good time to do that. We are going to stay in the text, so you'll have a great advantage to keeping that open uh, where you can read along and participate. Let me pray for us as we start our study in the Word of God this morning. Lord, your word says of itself that it is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Scripture also declares of itself that it is able to make us wise for salvation through Christ Jesus. We confess this morning that we need to be cut by the word. We need to have scripture expose our hearts And make us wise for salvation. We need to be shaped and moulded to be more like Christ. I pray this morning that you would speak through me, an unworthy servant. That your truth might be applied to our hearts and minds. Would you apply your word by your spirit to your people. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. As we saw last night, the year is approximately 600 BC, give or take a few years. Wicked King Jehoiakim is the ruler of Judah and God's people have become utterly corrupt. And so as we read last night, distressed by the wickedness of Judah, Habakkuk comes to God lamenting the situation and asking him, how long will you tolerate all this wickedness and sin? God reassures Habakkuk that he has seen the wickedness. And in response, however, he will allow the even more wicked Babylonians to conquer the nation of Israel. Well, Habakkuk kind of knows this is a fair outcome for Judah. He's now plagued by another concern. As much as it's terrible that God's people are wicked, how can it be okay that God allows someone even worse To come in and thrash God's chosen people. What about the promises to the patriarchs? How does this decision vindicate the glory of God? In the prophet's lament, we find questions that have been asked about God's character and actions down through history, even to our lives here in 21st century Australia. In God's response to Habakkuk, We will find answers that speak not just into Habakkuk's situation, but also principles that speak down through history into our context as well. We're going to break down today's passage into three sections. and We're going to see uh, the prophet's protest. Yes, I I, I had fun with alliteration again. Uh, The prophet's protest in chapter 1 verse 12 through to the start of chapter 2. Chapter 2, verses uh, 2 to 5, we will see the covenant creator's comfort. Yeah, okay, I know. Uh, And in chapter 2, verses 6 to 20, we will see the Chaldeans. It's another name for the Babylonians. The Chaldeans' condemnation. So let's have a little bit of a look at the prophet's protest. Read with me if you would. We're going to turn Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12. 1 to 12. Chapter 1, verse 12. To chapter 2, verse 1. This is Habakkuk's second complaint. Habakkuk writes, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, 
And you, O rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in with his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net. He makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? Chapter 2. I will take my stand at the watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me, what I will answer concerning my complaint. God has just told Habakkuk that in response to the wickedness of Judah, he will send the Chaldeans, or some translations might say the Babylonians, to conquer them and carry them away. Habakkuk is distressed by the behaviour of his fellow Jews. But he now expresses a new concern to to Yahweh, the covenant name of God. In our translations, Lord, all caps. He essentially asks, how can a holy God use such an unholy people to inflict justice on God's covenant people? So first, what he does is he recounts God's character. He asks, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? Now, depending on your translation, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. That's my favorite translation. He refers to God as being from everlasting, or your translation might say from antiquity. And I think in some sense that carries a better sense of God's relationship to the ancient patriarchs. I think this actually fits better in the context. Habakkuk uses the divine name, Yahweh, Lord in our translation. And he speaks of him as my God, my Holy One. It's personal. It's covenantal language. Habakkuk speaks to God as one who is is in relationship with him. And again, depending on your translation, we may have a discrepancy here. And some of you may may notice that if you're reading something like the NIV. The ESV says, we, that is the people of God, shall not die. But if you're reading the NIV, it says, you, as in God, will never die. It's quite a different translation. So which is it? I think the NIV makes a theologically accurate statement, God will never die. But I think in saying, we shall not die, Habakkuk is recognising God's promise To the people of Israel. He's always promised to preserve a remnant of the people. Israel will never be completely wiped out. He has promised that one of David's sons will always sit on the throne of Israel. And so even though God might allow the people to be heavily afflicted. His promises stand. And so Habakkuk here acknowledges this will not be the end for God's people. Even though the Chaldeans will come in and wipe them out for the most part, he believes the promises of God. But you can also see that he's acknowledging that God has ordained the Chaldeans as judgment for sin and for reproof. That is a correction of their path. He, He understands why the Chaldeans are coming. And he now states his concern. Verse 13 He says, you who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Habakkuk recognises God's perfection. And he asks an almost identical question to the one that he asked earlier in verse 3. How can you look on while this evil is happening and not act? I mean, yeah, Judah is really wicked right now. But how can you be okay with the Chaldeans? They're much worse. I want you to see here, Habakkuk rightly expresses God's character and nature in his prayer. He's clearly an excellent theologian. He knows the character of God. He knows the works of God. He knows the promises of God. And it's to those things 
that he speaks in his prayer. He sees a conflict between what he sees and hears happening and what he knows is true of God and the promises. In this lamenting prayer, he sets us a wonderful example of how we can bring our concerns to God. We should strive to know the one that we pray to so that we speak to him with right speech. Now Habakkuk also he is expressing a sentiment very similar to the one that Abraham expresses in Genesis chapter 18. I don't know if you know that story, but Abraham asked God whether uh, he would allow the righteous who might be dwelling in Sodom and Gomorrah to be swept away when God wipes out the wicked. The people of Judah are in serious rebellion. We know that the leaders are corrupt and causing God's name and reputation to be blasphemed. But Habakkuk makes an assumption here. He assumes that among the wicked people in Judah, there are also some who are righteous, who do not deserve such a brutal judgment. There are some that, even though they're stained with sin, as all of us are, all people are subject to sin... Those people are not guilty of the vile and wicked corruption that is currently running through God's people. He says, for the sake of God's name, he is concerned that these people are spared. As Abraham objected, he says, far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? So Habakkuk recounts God's character. He then makes some observations about the Chaldeans. He recounts the Chaldeans' character. Verse 14, Habakkuk describes how God makes the multitudes, that is all the people, and in verse 15, the Chaldeans sweep them up as as if they were the fish of the sea, caught up in a dragnet. The conquered people are seen as practically valueless. Simply, by their capture, the Chaldeans are getting material prosperity. They're getting land and people and possessions. The Chaldeans don't care about the welfare of the conquered nations. They care about a full stomach and a luxurious life. So that when their conquering gives them that that blessing, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore, Habakkuk writes in verse 16, he, that is the Chaldean, sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. The Chaldeans have no recognition at all that they are God's instrument in this. That they are being used by him. They don't acknowledge Yahweh as the one who has ordained their success. And so what do they worship? They worship their own strength, their own prosperity, their own success. They praise their own military might and power. Essentially they're idolatrous. Habakkuk recounts God's character. He recounts the Chaldeans' character. Now, he resolves to watch and wait. He asks God in verse 17, Is he, the Chaldeans, then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly mercilessly killing nations forever? Or in other words, as he asked earlier in the the chapter, O Lord, how long, O Lord? He sees the wickedness of Judah and he knows the punishment is right. He sees the wickedness of the Chaldeans and wants to be assured that God will deal justly with them also. He wants to know that the season of punishment has an end and that God's character will again be vindicated. This is not a despairing cry from one who believes that this will be the end of God's people or that God is somehow going to contradict his own nature. Habakkuk knows that's not the case. No, this is a prayer of faith. In chapter 2, verse 1, he then resolves to wait for God to respond. God has spoken clearly to Habakkuk in the past. He's given him answers and he now trusts that God will speak again to vindicate his own name. He takes a position on the wall, not unusual for a prophet of God, and contends himself to wait. How long does he wait there? We don't know. The text doesn't tell us how long he waited for a response. You notice as well, there's no arrogance in his tone. In fact, depending on how you translate that last little phrase of of chapter 2, verse 1, he seems to expect that when he receives a response from God, 
it's going to correct his perspective. In essence, Habakkuk says he doesn't know how such a holy God can allow such a wicked people to thrive at the expense of God's own people. But he knows God must have an answer. And so he's waiting for God to set him straight. Wow. Do you pray like that when you face a trial? I don't most of the time. My prayer is usually asking God to change the hard situation that I'm facing. Habakkuk recognises the sovereign God has ordained this situation. That God is good. He always does what is right. He expresses his concern. And then he asks God to help him understand. He recounts God's character. He recounts the Chaldean's character. He resolves to watch and wait. So that's the prophet's protest. Moving on just a little bit. We then look at the covenant creator's comfort. Let's read uh, chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. This is the Lord answering Habakkuk. The Lord answered me. Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up in him. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. God does respond to Habakkuk. He's not silent as Habakkuk suggests in verse Chapter 1, verse 13. The first thing he does, he instructs Habakkuk to write it down. Make it plain. Write it so that it can be transmitted to others and stand as a written testimony of God's speech. He wants this recorded and broadcast so that others will know the decree of God. That what, when what God has ordained comes to pass, when it happens, everyone will be able to point to what Habakkuk wrote down And acknowledge that God had promised it would happen. It's not going to happen by chance. It's not random. It was all planned and carried out according to the will of the sovereign God of all creation. God then declares in verse 3 that it is coming at the appointed time. It will happen on God's time frame, not on theirs. Wait for judgment. In chapter 1, verse 17, Habakkuk essentially asked, how long? And here God answers, at the right time. Perhaps not the most satisfying answer. God calls Habakkuk to have patience regarding the timing of God's solution. God's timing will be perfect. He calls Habakkuk to continue to trust in him. God's got this under control. He comforts the distressed prophet with the promise That he has seen the evil and he will respond at the right time. God then begins to describe what is coming for the puffed up, arrogant Chaldeans who trust in themselves and their own military might. The rest of this chapter will describe in vivid language the Chaldeans' destruction. But as he begins to answer Habakkuk, he makes a small, reassuring statement for Habakkuk. The righteous, he says will live by his faith. Now, if that statement, the righteous shall live by his faith, sounds familiar to you, that's because it's a phrase quoted at least three times in the New Testament. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul picks up this phrase in Romans chapter 1 and Galatians 3 and applies it to speak of how a person is not made righteous by keeping the the laws of God, but by trusting in the promises of God in faith. A person is not righteous And so they trust in God. They trust God and they are made righteous. It's the other way around. The writer of the Hebrews also uses the verse to argue that by faith is the way a saved person will live. That is their faith is the evidence of the righteousness that they have received. In our text, in the answer to Habakkuk's concern over the fate of righteous individuals who dwell amongst the corrupt rulers and leaders of Israel, God promises that those who are not involved in that corruption will live. They are righteous, not in the sense that they don't sin, 
but in the sense that they have remained faithful to the covenant. It is by their faithfulness that they will be spared. God says, write it down, chapter 2, verse 2. Wait for judgment, chapter 2, verse 3. Wickedness will be condemned. That's the covenant creator's comfort. He now speaks of the Chaldeans' condemnation. Picking up at verse 5. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as white as Sheol. Like death, he, never, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own, for how long, and loads him up with pledges? Will your debtors... Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those, who, uh, those awake who will make you tremble? Then you will be spoiled for them. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnants of the peoples shall plunder you. For the blood of man and of violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with blood, founds a city on iniquity. Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that people labour merely for fire, and nations wearing themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who makes his neighbours drink, to pour out your, you pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you. And utter, and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them. For the blood of man and violence to the earth and the city to all who dwell in them. What profit is an idol when his maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies. For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake! To a silent stone, Arise! Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver. There is no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. The Lord now starts to speak of the fate of the Chaldeans for their oppression of other people groups. Uh, You'll notice the language there in many ways, it's quite poetic. And so it's a little bit tricky to grasp the images that, that the Lord is using there. Having just described the Chaldeans as puffed up, he then says, Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. So just as a person who has drunk too much might believe they're invincible, so the Chaldeans... Drunk on their conquest, do not believe they're in any danger at all. Their appetite is insatiable and they continue to gather all peoples in for their own consumption. However, in verse 6, God declares that these gathered peoples will take up their taunt against them. Uh, The term translated here is scoffing. It's got the sense of a mocking poem that will be sung over the Chaldeans in their demise. Uh, this, This section that I just read... This song, it's it's structured as a series of five woes that describe the destruction and humiliation of the Chaldeans. We could spend a really long time unpacking those verses. I'm not going to unpack them all for you. We'd be here for a while. So for the sake of time, let me read just a short summary from uh, Robert Chisholm. He writes, The Babylonians built an empire by robbing and killing. They left behind them a trail of blood and ruined cities. In their arrogance, they even invaded the great forest of Lebanon, assaulted its trees and animals. Like an eagle that builds a nest on a high place, they thought they were secure, but a day of reckoning would come. Babylon's empire seemed like a sturdy house, but the very stones and woodwork of this house, symbolising the wealth taken from others, would testify to its crimes. Babylon's victims would rise up like merciless creditors and demand retribution, treating the Babylonians the way they had treated others. The Lord Almighty, not Babylon, rules the earth, 
and frustrates the imperialistic efforts of nations like Babylon. He would dish out to Babylon what she had dished out to others. Babylon is pictured as one who forces others to drink an intoxicating beverage until they are so drunk and silly they expose themselves, much to taunting Babylon's amusement. The underlying reality may be the practice of publicly humiliating prisoners by exposing their nakedness, but now was Babylon's turn to be humiliated. The Lord's right hand, symbolising his strength, was passing the cup of intoxicating beverage to Babylon. Babylon would be forced to drink to the point where, drunken and silly, it exposed its nakedness. The Babylonians trusted in their idol gods, which would be unable to protect them from divine judgment. In contrast to these man-made lifeless gods, the Lord rules the earth from his heavenly palace. In his presence, the whole earth must stand in awestruck silence. End quote. God would vindicate his own name and fulfill the promises to the patriarchs. Verse 14, he says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And then verse 20, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. What are we to make of this passage of scripture? Now, I, I noted last night, our, our context is not ancient Israel. We're not to take this passage and allegorically apply the text to our circumstance. Well, what is our circumstance? Circumstance, Christians here are a tiny minority of faithful believers among a vast flood of unbelief. We are now surrounded by a hostile world system that stands totally opposed to God. Sin is celebrated while Christianity is is seen as repressive, old-fashioned and offensive. We're told that our Christian values and ideas are not acceptable in this modern society and we need to shut up and fall in line. Don't comply, you'll find yourself on the back of a lawsuit. Or worse, here in Australia we're not yet at risk of death for our faith, but that's a reality that many of our brothers and sisters face on a daily basis around the world. And there's nothing to guarantee that that is not coming to us anytime soon. Make no mistake, we are living in the midst of hostility. Jesus told us in John 15, verse 18, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. That's our reality. That's where we stand as 21st century Christians here in Australia. I think there are three applications from our text today. Last night when we spoke about Habakkuk's first complaint, I said that we should first cry out to God in lament over the state of the church and over the state of our own spiritual walk, which falls short so often. Having looked inwardly, just as Habakkuk turns his face towards the Chaldeans... So we should turn our face toward the world system and cry out, How long, O Lord? How long will God allow this world to keep persecuting his children? How long will this world keep rejecting its creator and blaspheming his name? How long will our culture celebrate sin? How long, O God, will you allow this to keep happening? It is right to cry out and lament. We love God, and so we want to see his name honoured by all around it. And it grieves us, it should grieve us, to see his name blasphemed and maligned. We should cry out in prayer and lament to God about this world. Secondly, just like Habakkuk, we must be good theologians who know who our God is and what he has said. You must know this book. You have to. If you don't know this book and you don't understand who God is and what he's said, you will not be able to come to him rightly in prayer. You must know this book. You must read it. You must study it. You must memorize it. You must know the God who wrote this book. So that when you look at the world and are tempted to despair, you are able to recall what God has said. You need to know that he's good, that he's sovereign, that he's holy, that he's just. You need to know what has happened in the past 
And you need to know what he has said will happen in the future. Psalm 62 verses 6 to 8 says, He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. You must know him. Thirdly, know that God has decreed a day when all of this will be dealt with. God has seen the sin and wickedness of our world. Just like God has decreed a day when the arrogant Chaldeans would be judged, so God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given us assurance to all by raising him from the dead. It's coming. The day is fixed. 2 Peter 3.9 reminds us, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God has delayed thus far so that we may come to him and be saved when we repent and trust alone in the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross. God, in his patience, did not strike you and I down the moment we first sinned, which he would have been right to do so. But instead, he patiently endures our sin and he calls us to himself. Scripture declares to us that in any given congregation, any gathering, there are always going to be those who ultimately have not believed rightly. And so I, I would be remiss in my duty as a preacher to ask, to not ask, have you answered that call? Have you bowed the knee and surrendered to Jesus? Have you acknowledged your rebellion and thrown yourself on his mercy and grace? Being in church does not make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. Jesus declared you must be born again. Has that happened to you? Is there evidence in your life of a genuinely changed existence? God's patience will not last forever. He will not always overlook sin. There is a day appointed for you and a day appointed for me when our heart will stop beating, our lungs will stop drawing breath. And on that day, we will stand before the God who made us and your response to him in this life, here and now, while those parts of our body are still functioning, will dictate where you spend eternity. I can implore you, uh, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We should cry out about our nation. We must know who our God is and what he has said. And there is a day coming when he will judge all people. Let's pray. Lord, we recognise that you are a holy and pure and, and perfect God who cannot look upon sin. You have no patience uh, for uh, outright rebellion in the sense that you will not ignore it, you will not... You will not uh, overlook it. We know that your justice is pure. And yet you have extreme patience with us. In that you allow us time. You allow us the opportunity to hear the word of God preached. You allow us to be confronted in our sin. We recognise that you are the all-knowing God. That you are a God who, who understands the way this world will play out. The future is no secret to you. And even though you have not given us all the details about what is to come and how these things will play out, we rest comfort comfortably in your character and nature, knowing that you are a sovereign God who has this in control. We acknowledge this morning that we have not always responded rightly to the world. So often when we see the sin and the wickedness and the oppression that comes towards us as Christians, we have responded in kind with hostility and disgust. We have responded by fighting back. And what you've called us to do is come to you and trust you that you're in control. 
We confess that we have not always trusted in your timing when these trials come in our life. We confess that more often than not, we we seek to be the engineers of our own situation, to force your hand. Oh, forgive us for our sin this morning. We thank you this morning that you are coming back, Lord Jesus. We know that there is a day coming when you will return. Those of us who are in Christ will be rewarded. And those who are outside of Christ will be judged. And you will be glorified in that judgment. We thank you that you will save all who trust in you. That the shed blood of Jesus on the cross is is more than sufficient to pay the penalty for our sins. We thank you that you are patiently allowing more time for more people to turn and trust in you. Oh, please help us trust in your timing, Lord Jesus. Please help us to, to trust you when our circumstance around us looks grim, when we're facing a difficult season in this nation where we see oppression coming more and more each day. Please help us to live holy lives that stand distinct from the world, that testify to your greatness. And Lord, we pray that you would save those who have not yet trusted in you. That maybe even this morning, as as people have heard the word expounded, they might come to realise they have trusted in themselves and their efforts and not in you. Lord, we pray that you would save many for the name, sake of your own name and for your own glory. And it's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. To finish this time this morning, before we go to morning tea, um, what I'd like to do is just to take a few minutes to quietly reflect on what we've been studying. Um, we're, we're not going to have music. We're just going to give ourselves just a little bit of space just in your own seat where you are to quietly reflect on the things we've been discussing. Uh, so what I ask, uh, if, you've, if you've had a few minutes and you feel like you've had enough uh, time to reflect, feel free to hop up and move off, grab yourself your morning tea or whatever, maybe move outside. But I'd also ask this morning, if something we've been studying has convicted you, challenged you, uh, and you would like to be prayed for, uh, myself and Pastor Ray and a couple of others will, will, will hang around. And if you'd like prayer, come, come and see us, come and chat. Or, or by all means, chat to the person who's sitting beside you and ask them if they will pray for you. But we're going to leave this space quiet for a little while so that people can have that time to reflect. So now just in quietness, it's a time just to step back, relax and, and think about what we've been studying and the way we need to apply these things in our lives. And uh, as once you're done, feel free to move off and, and have some morning tea.